Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available online free for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are my panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. He's also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Chris. Also with us is Rick Samuelson, graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. He is also retired head of securities, UBS Japan. And the purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept for your consideration and our panel will react with criticisms, questions, and their own definitions. This week, the subject concept of usage is why do governments expand inexorably? We all see throughout the world the expansion of government. Nothing seems to restrain them. The news is full of reports of Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and others having bloated governments, engorging themselves to the extent that they can no longer even pay their bills. The word default is everywhere. Even here in the U.S., the government has expanded steadily from the 1930s to present day. In the past three years, our government expansion has even accelerated, doubling the size of the national debt. The government scream that they do not have enough money and thus raise taxes. After raising taxes, they go out and spend more. Nice racket. And they all do it repeatedly. Can you think of an exception? Maybe some small island city state, but all the majors do it. So the question is, why? The philosophical hangle has <clears throat> concluded that it's because of the ideology of liberalism, which is prevalent within the Democratic Party since the 1930s. What, you say? You object. You are thinking that Republicans spend and tax also. Yes, that is sometimes true. But the greater tendency is within the liberal ideology. And so, when a Republican Party member joins the spending, that GOP member is not a conservative for that time, as we are speaking here of the difference between the liberal and conservative thought. Here is the explanation. First, the difference between a liberal and a conservative is that conservatives assume first that others in society are inherently good. Liberals think that inherently others are bad. That is, people in general have bad motives and cannot <coughs> be trusted. As a result, people cannot be trusted with making their own decisions. As an example, what do liberal Democrats say about the invasion of Iraq? They say that we should not have brought democracy to Iraq because the people are not ready for it. In other words, the Iraqi people are not ready to make their own decisions. This reaction would exasperate a conservative who believes that people everywhere would like to be left alone to make their own decisions. Well, their explanation is that others are not ready to make their own decisions. And that is, they are inherently bad or incompetent. Also. Because there are bad people everywhere, there are victims everywhere. Hence, for liberals, there are people that cannot be trusted and 
there are victims of these people or those who are not ready to make their own decisions. For conservatives, people are inherently good and as such, people in general try to be the best they can in their daily lives without intent to do harm to others. The liberal further concludes, because there are those that should not be trusted with their decisions, there needs to be regulation of their activities. And because there are victims of the activities of these people, there needs to be assistance available for them. This assistance and regulation should be administered by a centralized authority, which would be the government. Thus, a larger governmental bureaucracy develops, assisting the victims who are unable to help themselves against the evildoers of society. For example, these greedy Wall Street bankers, those terribly cruel robber barons, and additionally, the large bureaucracy helps to create and administer the regulations needed to keep these evildoers in check. Further, because society is made up of these evildoers and their victims, agreements are suspect as to their validity because victims are inherently incompetent to enter into contracts with others in society who are inherently bad in their intentions. This rationale allows the liberal to consider all contracts subservient to the will of the government, including the original contract between the people and the formation of the government known as the U.S. Constitution. With such a rationale in place, the liberal would feel comfortable <coughs> in allowing the government to arbitrarily change this document to conform to the present will of the government. Thus, the liberals tend to have a loose interpretation of the Constitution. And conversely, the conservatives would have a strict interpretational view. But further, there was one more and greater devastative effect of this thinking of the liberal. Because the liberal mistrusts others in society who are not of this ideology, they believe that agreements must be subject to review by the government, and as such, sometimes need to be broken as they feel that the end justifies the means. <coughs> when the ideology of the end justifies the means is in place, the concept of ethics vanishes and the government, or should I say the leaders of the government, may use their ultimate societal power to put into place anything that they feel is good and necessary. And this thought that government and its leaders are above and beyond the sanctity of contracts in the past has allowed the world to witness the pogroms of the 20th century. Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, and Castro were totalitarian communists that adhered to no democratic republic constitution. Hitler was the head of the Nazi party, which was a socialist party, and he canceled the Germany's constitution through its emergency clause and then implemented his idea of the good. If there is no adherence to contracts by government, then there is an absolute power. And we know, as Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Looking to our notes, we have diagrammed this little explanation on the board for your reference. And now we go to our panelists for a reaction. Mark, your thoughts, please. Chris, you said so much, I don't know where to begin, so I'm going to take a couple of pot shots at a bunch of different things. First of all, you said that uh, in an ends-based <coughs> ethics vanishes. 
Well, there are actually ends-based ethical systems, such as utilitarianism, so that's one version that people do rely on. I think what you meant to say is that deontological ethical systems, which are better ethical systems, vanish when we focus only on the ends. Um, you also mentioned that the Iraqis are not ready for uh, democracy. Well, you know who was ready for, for democracy? It was the Germans in the 1930s. Hitler was democratically elected. So before we get too excited about democracy as being handed down from the Greeks as this great panacea that's going to turn the Middle East into the Middle West, we should remember what happens in democratic elections. Remember, uh, they had a democratic election also in, in Palestine or whatever it's called, and Hezbollah or Hamas won, and we said, that's not the kind of democracy that we want in the Middle East. Well, that was just a democratic election. It happened. It worked. Uh, you got to take the good with the bad. Uh, you also talked about centralization and how Democrats are all about centralizing. Well, let's go back to who was the very first centralizer in this country. That would have been Honest Abe Lincoln, the Republican president. He basically took the Constitution, tore it to shreds, and, we, and he is the guy who set centralization in motion from the word go. Let's skip ahead 100 years, 130 years, whatever it was. Um, Let's centralize. I have an idea. We were attacked. Let's centralize the security function at airports. Let's start something called the TSA. Who did that? Was that Barack Obama? Was that Bill Clinton? No, it was the communist in between. So to even think for one nanosecond that Republicans are any less into centralized power than Democrats is insane. And we probably need to change our taxonomy here because you keep using the word liberal. Uh, for an historian like me, the word liberal does not mean the things you keep pointing out. I think what you're pointing out really is leftists. So let's call them leftists. That's who I think the three of us have a bigger problem with. Um, and I, I still go back to our foundational disagreement. You say that liberals think people are evil and conservatives think they're good. Think they're good. It's actually the exact opposite. Conservatives are the ones who are willing to say, you know what, we need Ten Commandments. We should obey the Ten Commandments. Humans are fallen. They have fallen from grace. They need rules to be kind of harnessed. Uh, you're kind of proposing this Rousseauian, man is born free and everywhere placed in chains. So that right there is, is our foundational disagreement. And we've got to just stop calling liberals uh, liberals because they're leftists. Okay, well taken. Uh, I used uh, liberal in the modern sense or the current, me uh, current media sense, I suppose, because it's used. Yeah, I think, and I think there's an imprecision there that's important because you know, technically, Adam Smith was a liberal. He was a classical liberal. Yes, yeah, so you're uh, right. You go through the whole line of them, from Smith to Mill to Bentham to List, up until Marx. Uh, they were all classical liberals. So, uh, you know, to call Barack Obama, Barack Obama and Adam Smith had very little in common, but technically they're both liberals. So yeah, you're let's right. Let's call Obama what he is a leftist. The 18th century uh, liberal, uh, was, uh, especially the economists, were uh, were today's conservative uh, uh, Monetarist. Yeah, well, they were liberalizing, liberalizing from you know a monarchical system. Correct. So there's a, there's an important point there. Right, and the uh, term now has been switched. Uh, Rick, your thoughts, please. Uh, well, there's a lot there to comment on. Um, I'd like to go back for a moment to just um, viewing the government uh, from an economic perspective. Big government is, is actually like a, a monopoly on steroids. Uh, and I say that because it, not only do they uh, have a tendency to ever increase their scope of operation and size, they can also make the rules uh, and judge the rules. And notwithstanding, you know, the balance of power concept, which is um, so essential to our constitutional democracy, or republic, um, at, at the limit, what we're observing is that in the absence of any kind of price signal or profit motive or means of discipline, whether it's a Democratic Party in, in power or a Republican Party in power, the, the funda fundamental dynamic of government growth remains largely unaltered. It's just a question of uh, how quickly it, it grows, really. And, and so your, your observation at the very beginning is absolutely correct. And you can see, you know, what the consequences of that are. Um, I mean, if you read the New York Times editorial page, 
you know, day after day, they talk about the need to spend more money because the poor are getting poorer and the middle class are falling apart and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, with never a mention of the fact that with that comes uh, less freedom, uh, more cost for future generations, the consequences in terms of uh, more regulation, and every regulation costs money for someone somewhere. Uh, so I think those are the sorts of issues you're trying to drive at, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Chris, can I address something that he said? Go uh, ahead. Before, before one of our viewers would hear those comments and run out and pull the lever for Willard Romney in, in, in total error, um, let's also give fair time here to the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, who is constantly screaming that we must expand the size of government and grow government in terms of defense spending and subsidies to business, subsidy to, subs not, not to business, to corporations uh, and crony capitalism. So while, you know, the New York Times has its constituents uh, at the risk of not bringing the Southern Poverty Law Center's wrath down upon me, I won't name them, but we know who they are, uh, they are fighting for their constituents. The Wall Street Journal is fighting for its constituents, and we're all just footing the bill because the benefits to each of those constituents is concentrated and to each of us, it's diffuse, but it's becoming less and less diffuse as tax rates start to skyrocket, as the national debt starts to metastasize. Um, but you know, b before we start again, before we start bashing the New York Times, let's also take the New York Times to task because you know there is some limit to national defense. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has not discovered that number yet. But Rick's right. You know, I, I think it's teleological. Governments just grow until they completely consume everything, and then they explode, like Weimar Germany does. Stalin, Castro, Hitler, they didn't have to grow so much because they started off from a totalitarian position. Our government, we're still trying to get there, and we're getting there, and we're getting there quickly. And, you know, it's just a question of who's going to get us there more quickly, Willard Romney or Obama, and I think that's a coin flip. Um, well, I, I think um, I have to take issue on one point uh, that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, you lumped uh, defense in with the rest of the uh, uh, growth in government, but defense has uh, two points that are uh, set that make it separate uh, in the conversation. One point I believe is that it is enumerated in the Constitution as one of the primary uh, uh, obligations of the U.S. government uh, it would be to provide uh, defense, and and its growth has not been uh, unabated. Uh, it has fluctuated. Uh, significantly from the 1930s to today, I believe it is now at about 14 percent of uh, GDP. Uh, and, uh, and that's up and down from uh, according to when there are wars and, and, and no wars and, uh, and what's going on in the, in the general geopolitical sphere. However, uh, entitlements have grown steadily, uh, and they are not in the Constitution uh, directly as a, as a responsibility of the government. Uh, and so uh, I, I tend to think that this should be separated out as, a, as, a, as two separate issues. And particularly here today, uh, I uh, uh, would like to point out that is the entitlements from 1930 uh, to present day that have gone uh, amok, that have gone uh, 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 exponentially upward. And uh, if we go back to Lincoln, uh, we might as well go back to Hamilton as for centralization of power and the arguments for it. But those, again, were, were, were arguments of our, they were, had separate problems and were not uh, 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 problems of entitlement states. Uh, so, and, and the purpose today is to explain the, uh, the, the problem of the entitlement state. Okay, good. So I wasn't calling for the abolition of the military, if, if that's what, the way it came off. Uh, either I misspoke or you misheard me. I just said that there is a limit to what we should be spending militarily. And you were the one who said earlier that, you know, conservatives go back to the Constitution. I would argue conservatives actually go back to the documents that were underpinning the Constitution and what people were writing at the time to kind of come up with this document. And they clearly warned us against having a standing army. They clearly reminded us time and again, you know, look back at the Italian Renaissance. When the military suddenly took over the government, empires collapsed. And if you're going to tell me, you know, that we need 150,000 troops in Germany to prevent the Soviets who collapsed 20 years ago from invading 
East Germany, and we need 35,000 troops in South Korea and another 35,000 troops in uh, Japan. And Camp Bonsteel, which Clinton promised us would be closed immediately after we left the Balkans, which is still there. Over 800 military facilities spread across 150 countries with 40 Lear jets to travel to, for generals to travel around on, and over 200 golf courses with 40,000 foreigners working on them. If you tell me that that's what we need and that's not part of the inexorable growth of government, then I'm on the wrong show. Uh, Rick, any comments? Well, I, I, I think it, you're right. The, compared to the military, uh, the entitlements have grown much faster, and that's and it's the entitlements that are going to be the source of a, a fiscal catastrophe in the not too distant future for the United States. Exactly. Uh, but is there waste in the military? Uh, I mean, I saw it. I was sure. I was in South Korea. I I used to uh, spend time on the on the uh, Eighth Army base there. I mean, there's a there's a fancy hotel and various other services, a huge go golf course, and you could argue that all of that stuff is is unnecessary, um, and it probably should be eliminated. Um, and I wouldn't disagree that we probably should pull more troops out of uh, South Korea and, and and Europe and just keep a, you know a trigger force, nominal trigger force, in the event of some problem. So maybe that's 10,000 troops uh, in each location. I don't know the number. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't believe, in fact I'm quite certain that as far as the fiscal condition of this country is concerned, it's not the military that's the central problem. Okay. Well, I mean, we can throw about the central problem is we have lots of problems. And to suddenly say, well, we're going to cordon that one off and not talk about that one is just to ignore the fact that we've got lots of problems and let's just focus on the one the ones that you know our constituents constituencies are, are, are least bothered by uh, you know if we want to talk about entitlements why don't we stop giving social security checks to people with you know say a billion dollars why don't we just draw the line right there and say you know you've got a billion dollars you're not going to get a social security check we won't even do that yeah um, or how so about this how about how about how about your you're 70 years old you're about to get your first social security check. You have no money whatsoever. You're, you're completely flat broke. But your son is a managing director at Morgan, at Morgan Stanley. Maybe he should be footing your bill. That's not a system we, that, the, that the Republicans are currently proposing. That would be my version of means testing, because the first person to come to your age should be your family, not the federal government, not the centralized federal government. I don't, so, you know, this is not a Republican or Democrat thing. Both parties are pressing this. Mitt Rom Willard Romney said, I will not touch Social Security. Oh, great. Thanks, Willard. You know, probably because he's all excited to get it because he's worth 250 million bucks. Well, uh, I agree with you. Uh, certainly, uh, the Social Security system is one of the entitlement programs that is, uh, uh, that is uh, expanding and uh, as well as many others. So the question really is, how do we stop it? Because the government inexorably grows larger. So how is a constitutional state, such as here that we hear, or a, a republic, a constitutional republic, how do we stop, how do we, how do we advocate to our parties, one way or the other, to prevent this growth of government? Any suggestions, guys? Uh, yeah, across the board cuts. That's the only thing that won't be beaten down in Congress over endless debate concerning whether entitlements should be cut more or the military should be cut more, just across the board cuts, 10 percent, 20 percent, and so on, immediately. And elimination of, so I, of possible. I, 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 I finally agree wholeheartedly with both of you. That's the solution. And Chris, I agree it's inexorably growing. Uh, but that solution will never pass. And Chris, your statement will happen. It will keep growing. It's go we, we are going. It's going to happen to us. We're not going to stop it. It is going to stop growing because we are going to be forced, either militarily, or by global financial markets through the dollar going to turning into nothing but scrip. We will be. Ha we will have our lunches handed to us at some point. And so whether we, we it's it's not. We're, we're 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 too immature. I mean, look at your average American. Twenty pounds overweight. Disgusting. 
all, all excited for his social security checks. He's not going to sit, sit up and say, you know what? Uh, I'm a baby boomer. We're the worst generation in the history of this country. We're going to hand off the country worse than the, the first generation ever to hand off the country in worse shape than we inherited it. You know what? Cut my Medicare. Cut my Social Security. You know, forget forget about my student loans. I'm just going to pay my kids tuition. Never going to happen. The global markets or somebody will do it to us militarily. Okay, so you're predicting a, a, a really kind of a Greece-like scenario in the future, really for. Uh, all the all the countries that uh, have governments inexorably and exponentially growing uh, will come, and eventually the United States will become like the United States of Greece, and face. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been a great run. It's been a great run. Uh, Europe, you know, we're looking into the uh, we're looking through the windshield when we see Europe, and we look in the rearview mirror and we see Japan. So we're just right in between that those two processes. Okay, and uh, so we take Rick's possible solution, and perhaps uh, we need to purport that and advocate that uh, here at the philosophical angle, and 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 th and and also throughout the media, uh, uh, the, and the candidates themselves need to uh, warn the citizenry of, of this impending disaster. Show, show me, show me one candidate from either party who's coming anywhere close to what Rick is proposing. I cannot, and I wish thank I could. You, thank you, but 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 at the same time, so at the same time, we have Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly telling us, you know, Willard Romney's going to save the day, or Santorum, or whoever. It's hopeless. I agree, and uh, it is our job to uh, to possibly uh, get candidates to wake up and just across the board cuts. How is this uh, is this possible, guys? That the uh, can that one of the candidates might. Uh, might pick up on this as the only way to uh, secure our future or to prevent in, in uh, our, our doom? Well, Ron Paul probably comes closest to advocating something like that. Probably. Uh, yes. But, you know, he's disappearing rapidly from the polls. How about yeah, Rick Santoro? You know, the old saying, all dissent is pathologized. He actually comes out with reasonable solutions and he's dissenting from, you know, the single party platform that the Democrats and Republicans run on. So we have, over the last four years, just completely pathologized him. Okay. He's, he's a bacillus at this point. Okay, guys, well, I want to thank you for uh, uh, being present and, uh, uh, and uh, giving us your views on the uh, problem of the inexorable advancement of government. And uh, we'd like to say uh, thanks, and we'll see you next week. Okay, ciao. Thank you. Thank you.